Okay, well, as I mentioned before, our sermon text is actually John chapter 6, and I believe there are 71 verses, so uh, I don't want to read the whole text. I, I do, but I, I don't. Um, for the sake of time, let me just get to the root of the matter, the verses that, that, are, that, that we really want to focus on, though we are going to see a few things regarding evangelism in this, um, in this whole chapter. Um, that we can apply to our own evangelism. Uh, but let me just read this particular point because this really answers the question, I think, that we want to ask, and that is, again, if, if God is sovereign, why evangelize? Okay. So John six thirty seven through verse 44, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we have here election, we have God's choice of certain individuals to give to Jesus. Those are the ones who will come to him. Jesus will receive them. Everyone is welcome to come, but only these will come. And they will come because the Father draws them. And he also says that he gives eternal life to them and they will, they will not perish, but he will keep them. He says, of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus certainly believed. In election, he believed in um, eternal security, if I can put it that way. I'm not going to put it that way. Pre pers you know, perseverance of the saints. Preservation of the saints. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, with that in mind, let's uh, again just re remind ourselves, first of all, that we are considering another tough question. And that is, if you believe that God's sovereignty, because most, every, well, every Christian, every Christian believes that God is sovereign. You can't have a God who isn't sovereign. But not every Christian believes that that sovereignty extends to salvation. But the question is, for those who do, okay, if you believe that God's sovereignty extends to salvation, that those and only those he's chosen will be saved, doesn't that undermine evangelism? Doesn't it take away our motivation to share the gospel? I mean, why share the gospel if the non-elect don't have the ability to respond and they never will? Now, I remember a brother who used to be a part of this congregation said years ago, he goes, I don't think we should tell people that they can't believe when we're evangelizing. Well, they can't believe on their own, only by the grace of God. And maybe there's a place for that if, they, if you share it and they reject it. Okay, but, okay, why evangelize the non-elect if they can't respond? And then the other question is, if the elect are going to be saved anyway, whether we share it with them or not, and that's a trick question, okay, then why share with them? Okay, well, I think uh, our text this evening answers these questions. Um, it actually answers several other questions. It gives us a methodology for evangelism and, as I've said, answers these objections. So first of all, let's begin by considering how Jesus evangelized these Jews. Now first, and this perhaps is a debated point, it shouldn't be, especially when we think about the different camps of apologetics. You know, you've got presuppositionalism, you have classical apologetics, uh, and there's a differing understanding of what that means. So uh, maybe it, it's not good to think in those terms, but let me just point out one thing Jesus obviously did. He began his evangelism by giving evidence, okay, evidence of who he was, that he really was who he claimed to be. Now, John starts off this chapter, and again, we haven't read it. I'm not going to quote everything in the chapter, but I'm just going to tell you what it says, okay? Jesus starts this chapter by telling us that these Jews who were following Jesus were doing so because they had seen his miracles of healing 
the sick. Okay, so he already got their attention. He did miraculous things that only one sent from God could do, so they were following him. But we know in John chapter 6 that Jesus gave them another sign, another miracle that perhaps was even more convincing, and that is he fed this large number of people with just a small amount of food. When Jesus saw the people, remember he asked Philip, where can we find bread for all these people? And he was really testing Philip because Jesus already, you know, had a plan. Well, Philip knew that if he could find a place to buy bread, that the amount that they needed, if, if he could find a place that could even supply this amount, that to buy it was far beyond their means. He says 200 denarii is worth, and a denarius, remember, was a laborer's wage for a day's work. Even if we had over seven months of income, that wouldn't be enough for, for, for all these people even to have a little, okay? So the need was great, over 5,000 people, you know, 5,000 men besides women and children. Well, Andrew found a young man who had five loaves and two fish. And so Jesus said, have the crowd sit down. And he began breaking the bread and the fish and handing it out to the disciples who gave it to the people. And after everyone, again, over 5,000 men besides women and children had all that they wanted that he, he had the disciples pick up what was left over, and there were 12 full baskets. And, you know, it's been uh, thought that perhaps that was the reward, you know, the, the wage for the, uh, the disciples having done all this work. Now they each have their own basket. But 12 baskets full from something that wouldn't have even filled the bottom of a basket to begin with. Now, when the people saw this, they knew who Jesus was, and they were right. They said in verse 14, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. The prophet Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18, and they were right. That's exactly who he was. But they didn't understand what this prophet had actually come to do. They wanted to make him a king. Remember, the Jews were expecting their Messiah would be political. He'd be a military leader who would save them from Roman occupation. But what Jesus had really come to do was to save them from the tyranny of Satan, to save them from their sins, okay? So they had this misunderstanding of who Jesus was and what his purpose was uh, in the world. And so realizing that's what they wanted to do, that they missed the point, Jesus withdrew to a mountain by himself. Okay, so so far Jesus has given him two signs, right? He's healed the sick and he fed 5,000 with this small amount of food. But then he gives them a third sign the people saw him go up onto the mountain. Then when it was evening, they also saw the disciples get into a boat and start across the sea to Capernaum without Jesus. But what they didn't see was that sometime in the evening, Jesus came down from the mountain. He decided to walk across the water to where the disciples were and then to get in the boat with them. And when he did, there seems to be another miracle which the people didn't witness. And that is, even though they hadn't made much progress, as soon as Jesus got into the boat, suddenly they were in Capernaum. But in the morning, the people seeing that Jesus was no longer there, nor his disciples, got into some boats and they went across to Capernaum as well. And when they saw Jesus, they asked him when he had arrived there. What they were actually asking, I think, was how? How did you get here? You know, there's no boats. How did you get across the lake? Well, they knew that Jesus had done another miracle. Okay, so Jesus is giving them evidence, evidence of who he is, doing signs to prove that he is a messenger sent from God. And these signs worked, okay? Now he had their attention. You might say full attention. And so Jesus then begins to address their real need. He begins to preach the gospel to them. And that's really what all these these, uh, you know, images have to do with the bread from heaven. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, okay? Kind of an odd way of doing it, but Jesus is using food to point to himself, okay? Now, he turned the conversation, first of all, from what they were seeking, which was a king. You know, they wanted this king because this king could feed them. You know, he, he could take a little food and multiply it, and we need a king like this, a king who can provide all of our needs. We don't have to work anymore, right? More food, okay? 
he turned their attention from that, or was trying to, <laughs> to what they should be seeking, which is eternal life. Okay? He says in verse 27, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father has set his seal. Now, Jesus saying, you know, physical food, it's important. You know, Jesus made the food because they were hungry. We need it to sustain our lives. But Jesus came to give something far more important, food that gives eternal life. That, of course, would be him, okay? They need him. Now, it's interesting, and I think we find this particularly in the Gospel of John, how Jesus likens himself to various things and sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, to things that are eaten, things that are drunk, okay? Uh, just as he did with the woman at the well of Samaria, using the water from the well as a way to preach the gospel to her, so he does the same thing here with food, okay? And as the woman of the well asked, you know, when he said, if you knew who it was who's speaking to you, you would ask of him, and he would give you living water. The woman of Samaria asked, well, how, how do you get this living water when you, the well is so deep and, and you have nothing to draw with? And Jesus, of course, said, you have to believe in me. In the same way here, he's telling these people who are asking this question, how can we get this food that endures? I think they missed the eternal life part of it. But how can we get this food that endures? Verse 28, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Now, again, Jesus does the same thing here as he did with the woman at the well. Verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent, okay? Preaches the gospel to them through this image of food, okay? Now, notice when he says this is the work of God, he's not speaking about a work that we may do or must do in order to be saved. The work he's talking about is really just the opposite of a work. It's believing in him. And believing is him is where we look away from ourselves and everything we've done. And we look to what he has done and that alone to save us. It's to trust in him. That's what Jesus is trying to convey to them. Believe on me. But again, I think they missed the part about the, the food which endures to eternal life. I think they were just thinking enduring food. You know, more food. That's what we want is more food. That they didn't want to believe in him, what they wanted was another meal, okay? Um, the thought, you know, that Jesus was speaking of a way, they thought he was talking of a way that they might always be fed, you know, a food that continues to endure, that you can eat and doesn't run out, maybe like the oil of the widow um, in Zarephath. And so they asked in verse 30, again, after Jesus just told them, you need to believe in me, they said this, what then do you do for a sign? so that we may see and believe you. <laughs> what work do you perform? <laughs> now, let's not forget, he healed the sick, he fed the, the 5,000, he miraculously got across the lake without a boat, okay? Um, he's given them these three signs. So what are you gonna do now, Jesus? And then they narrow it down a little bit more to what they want him to do in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. How about doing a Moses here, Jesus? And why don't you just give us some of this manna from heaven? Again, they keep asking for food. But again, Jesus turns the conversation back to himself, that they need to trust in him. So he says, and again, he's preaching the gospel to them, verses 32 and 33. It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Ah, they said. Now, this, this sounds more like what we're after. So they said in verse 34, Lord, always give us this bread. That's what we want. So again, Jesus, as they are turning back again towards food, he turns back again towards the gospel, and he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. 
Now, it's at this point that Jesus knows it's a losing battle, okay? And so he begins to, you know, knowing how they're going to respond to this, you know, the idea that he's the bread, that's not what they're looking for. He heads off their reply. And here, what's interesting is he speaks about something that we rarely hear about today, particularly in evangelism, right? God's election. He speaks of, his, of election, verses 36 and 37. But I said to you that you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Now, Jesus says this because of their response to him over and over again. He keeps pointing to himself. You trust me. You need to believe in me. He keeps saying, give us more food. So now Jesus is saying, you've seen me, but you do not believe. Okay. How can you believe? All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Well, there's something that's missing, something they needed, something which apparently they didn't have. Okay, now they had seen the signs. They knew he was a messenger from God. They had heard the gospel, but they still didn't believe. And the question is why? Why didn't they believe? Doesn't everybody who sees miracles that Jesus did, didn't all of them believe? No. As a matter of fact, and many of them who saw the miracles actually got angry at him and accused him of being in league with the devil. Okay, miracles on, by themselves are not enough. What is missing, okay, in the picture? Well, it wasn't that Jesus failed to make his case. The evidence was overwhelming. It was because the Father had not given them to Jesus. He said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The implication is, you're not coming to me, which means the Father has not given you to me. They were not chosen. They were not elect. Now, the Jews didn't understand what he was talking about. They continued to argue with him. Well, wait a minute. How can you say you came down from heaven? We know who you are. We know who your father is, you know, Joseph. We know Mary, your mother. How can you say that you've come down out of heaven? Now, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't answer them, but he simply states, as a matter of fact, again, what he already said and emphasizes perhaps something even more important. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. This verse is so very important to understand how evangelism works. No one can. Okay? No one has the ability. No one has the power to come to him. You know, not, not to believe the gospel, to believe the facts. I mean, anyone can do that. The devils believe it. They tremble. But to come to him in a saving way. No one can come to him, he says, unless the Father draws him. And the word there for draw is compel or drag. It is to kind of, you know, the idea is essentially to force them to come. But we know that the way he does this is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will say in the same chapter later on, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing in verse 63. What you must do, he is saying, can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. You cannot do this in the power of nature as you come into the world. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. But the Father only gives the Spirit to those who are his elect, those whom he has chosen. Now, Jesus goes on to tell them other things that they even have greater difficulty with. He says that his flesh is living bread and that you have to eat me, he says, in order to live forever. You can imagine how that must have sounded to them. But again, it's a figure of speech. It's an analogy. And then he goes on to say they must not only eat his flesh, but they have to drink his blood if they are to have eternal life. And, you know, Jesus interestingly enough, doesn't actually even explain that, does he? He just simply says it, okay? But we know he doesn't mean this literally. He means it figuratively. He's the bread that comes down out of heaven, but he's not literal bread. He's not literal manna, but he is bread. 
He is the one that if we eat or believe on, we will have eternal life. And the same thing with regard to this other image, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Okay? His body was going to be broken. His blood was going to be shed so that all who believe in him would have eternal life. So he's likening faith to eating and, you know, his flesh and drinking his blood. Again, it's not an image that we would perhaps would use if we're evangelizing, but we need to understand what Jesus is talking about here. He is the bread from heaven. We need to eat him. We need to believe in him. Now, again, the people didn't understand. They thought he was speaking literally. And so did a number of his disciples. And so they left. The people, the crowd left. A number of his disciples, not the 12, of course, but these other disciples, they left. And as they were leaving, in verse 65, Jesus said to them, For this reason, this is why, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. You cannot come to me, he says, unless you've been chosen by God. Now, here's another interesting note in this uh, chapter, the 12, okay? They didn't understand what he was saying either. But when Jesus turned to them and he asked, do you also want to leave? Peter said this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So even though we don't understand what you're talking about here, Jesus, this is a hard saying. Who can, who can understand it? We do know that you are the source of eternal life, you alone, and we cannot go anywhere else, so we're going we're gonna to cling to you, okay? They continue to hold on to him by faith because they knew who he was. And that is true of everyone chosen by God who is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They will hold to Jesus even if they don't understand. Even if they don't understand this doctrine of election, they will hold to him. Okay. Okay, so this is what we see in the text. What I want to deal with now is what is it that we learn here about evangelism? Okay, well, there's a few things. First of all, that this is what the church is supposed to be about, right? Jesus started a work that his disciples were to continue. And since we're his disciples, this is what we're also to be doing. And I think that's pretty obvious. Second, that when we evangelize, we need to provide evidence. Okay? Jesus provided the very best evidence when he was evangelizing to prove that he was, in fact, who he said he was and that they should listen to him because he speaks the words of eternal life. And the way he did it was by doing these miraculous things. He gave proof. Now, we need to, to provide proof as well, but we can't do it in the same way. Okay? What we need is to use apologetics. Now, obviously, we cannot um, replicate the miracles that Jesus performed. We can only point to the eyewitness testimonies that he actually did these things which are recorded in Scripture. And, of course, we can also point out in Scripture. I think one thing we don't want to forget is that prophecy, that's you know, only God can tell the future. But Jesus definitely, uh, before... Um, before the event took place, many years before it took place, Jesus predicted with absolute precise detail what was going to happen to the temple, what was going to happen to Jerusalem before that generation of people then living would go off the scene, before they would die. And remember, we saw that series by R.C. Sproul on that. That's a very important point. Now, we can also point to general revelation, God's revelation of himself in nature to show that God exists, to show that God must exist, that there is one who could enable Jesus to do the things that he did. And let's not forget, R.C. said, that's where we need to begin. There has to be a God before there can be a word of God. And that many liberals dismiss the idea that the Bible could be the word of God because it claims to be the word of God, but we know God doesn't exist, so they just dismiss it. So show that God exists, and then show that the Bible is his word. Okay, so we need to be ready to give some arguments, present some evidence for the things that we're going to be 
sharing with them. And again, notice that Jesus didn't just simply say, I'm the Son of God, believe in me. But he actually gave them evidence, okay? Well, third, that we do need to present the gospel, obviously, the message of what Jesus has done to save sinners. Let's not forget how Jesus kept bringing the conversation back to their need of, of him. They wanted food, <laughs> and he wanted to give them food. But it was a different kind of food. It was the food they really needed. They needed him. And so he was telling them, believe in me. Okay, we need to tell our hearers to believe in Jesus. They need to trust in Jesus. If our hearers sidetrack us, like these people kept trying to do to Jesus, we need to get the conversation back on the right track. We need to keep it focused on their need. Remember what R.C. talked about, how um, when he was debating somebody about the truth of the Christian religion, he would say, tell me something. What do you do about your guilt? Well, people have guilt, and they sense that they need forgiveness. We need to keep the conversation focused on the fact that they do, in fact, need forgiveness. But Jesus alone is the one who can meet that need because he alone has made an atonement uh, that makes that possible. And then finally, we need to remember what the Bible teaches about election, okay? Most people are not going to listen to us, okay? They'll have a myriad of reasons why they don't believe the Bible, why they don't believe the gospel. I'm sure you've heard many of them. And there are even some who would say they don't believe in God. Although, as R.C. also pointed out, most people do believe in God. They just don't happen to believe in the right God. And they believe there is a God who exists. We hear about it all the time in politics. You know, God did this, God did that. But what God are they talking about? Sadly, at the end of the RNC, the first night of the RNC, there, there was this uh, woman who came out who was, a, I think, some kind of a pastor or practitioner in the Sikh religion. And she goes on chanting this song, and everybody's kind of looking at her like, <laughs> not sure if they were ready for that, but somebody lined that up. Say, so whose God are we talking about? You know, when we're talking about that they believe that God exists, okay? Well, there's only one true God. He's the only one who does exist. So anyway, we, we need to remember that there are going to be people who have all kinds of arguments, which is why we need to give them, again, that evidence. However, when it comes to election, let's not forget, you know, why is it that Spurgeon evangelized? Why is it that George Whitfield uh, gave himself so tirelessly, the Apostle Paul? It's because they knew that there would be those who would listen to them. Again, think about the, the 12 and actually the 11, okay, who heard Jesus say some pretty difficult things. But they believed, and they continued to believe even if they didn't understand, okay? There are those who are elect that the Father gives a spirit who compels them to come to Jesus, not against their will, but he changes their will to make them willing to come. It's not that these 12 were more gullible than the rest, again, God gave them His Spirit, and when God gives His Spirit, there is nothing that can tear that person away from Jesus. But now, let's go back to the original question, okay, that we were wanting to look at. Why should we evangelize if God elects? If the non-elect are never going to be saved, okay, why should we evangelize? If the elect are going to be saved, whether we share the gospel with them or not, doesn't belief in God's sovereignty kill evangelism? Well, as a matter of fact, it doesn't, okay? Did it kill Jesus' evangelism? No, okay? He believed in election, didn't he? All that the Father gives me will come to me. No one can come to me except the Father who sent me compels them to come. He believed in election, and it certainly didn't kill his evangelism. Now, in our passage, did Jesus preach to the non-elect? Yes, okay? Um, most of the people, virtually all of the people departed from him, and it doesn't necessarily mean they weren't all elect, but he did say, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and they weren't coming. So the implication is there. So why was Jesus preaching to them? Well, we know it's because God ordained that the gospel be preached to everyone. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 
But, but isn't that wasted effort? Because most of these people are, are essentially not going to be saved. Well, no, it's not wasted effort because God wants his gospel offered to everyone. And the reason he does is because he's gracious and he's merciful. And that offer that he gives is well meant. In other words, it, it is sincere. God is sincere. He will save them if they believe. If they don't believe, it's not because God hasn't made the offer. It's not because he hasn't made the provision. What we sang about at the opening, that's something that God has done to save sinners. And anyone, if, if they will, okay, can come. Or if they will, they can come. And if they come, they will be saved. And if they don't come, it's because they don't want to. And it's their own fault, not the Lord's fault. So it's not wasted effort to preach the gospel even to the non-elect. We're commanded to do this, and it really is a legitimate offer that God gives to them. And it's a gracious offer. They're going to have to answer for their not, answer, you know, not responding to it, but still that doesn't change the fact that it is a gracious offer. Now, what about the elect, though? Why should we share the gospel with them? Well, remember that Jesus went about preaching because he was seeking something. He was looking for the lost sheep, right? The lost coin, the, you know, the different images, the, the sheep that's, that's lost. How did he find them? Well, he knew that the way they would be found was through preaching, by preaching the gospel. He knew they would respond. That he knew the Father would bring them to him. That's how the elect are found. Now, it may be true that the elect will be saved if we don't bring them the gospel. And we need to be careful there because that can be an excuse for us not to share with somebody. We can say, well, if this person is elect, somebody else will share the gospel with them. I don't have to worry about it. Now, the Lord tells us we need to be ready to share, share the gospel with them as well. But even if we don't, we understand no one is saved, not even the elect, apart from hearing the gospel from someone. They need to hear it. Paul writes in Romans 10, verses 14 through 15, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Wasn't it um, William Carey who wanted to go? I, I believe it was to China. And he was seeking, um, I hope I got that right. <laughs> was it Carey went to China? Um, was it Hudson Taylor? Maybe it was Hudson Taylor. Anyway, somebody, he was, he was involved with a group of hyper-Calvinists. And when he was trying to mobilize everyone to do evangelism, those he was with said, don't, you know, sit, sit down, don't worry about this. Um, if, God is, if God intends to, sit, to save the heathen, he'll do it without your help or, or mine. Well, that's absolutely false. No one is going to be saved without the preaching of the gospel. Um, we need, that's why we do missions. That's why we need to get the gospel to them, because without it, they will perish. Okay, so they need to hear it. Even the elect, but the fact that there are elect gives us the confidence, again, that some will listen. Now, here's a couple of final questions. And coming back to, are all these people that rejected Christ on that occasion, are they all not elect? Well, what happens if we share the gospel with someone and they're rejected? You know, should we consider them a lost cause and, and no longer, you know, don't even try after that? Well, obviously not, okay? They may be chosen, but this might not be the time of his choosing in order to bring them to faith in Christ. So we need to continue to pray and give the truth to them because the Lord might yet show them mercy. And this is our hope, of course, for our children. Okay. They may not be responding now, but that doesn't mean they, they will always reject the gospel. Now, one last question. What if we share it with them? And they believe it. Okay. They believe it's true. They believe the facts. They believe the history. Okay. Like the devils, and they're convinced it actually took place, but they realize when they understand what a true believer is, somebody who loves Jesus and wants to follow and please him, that they don't have that desire in their hearts, that they realize they're not really born again, okay? 
Um, what do we do in a case like that? Well, that's where Reformed evangelism comes in. Remember, it's not within the power of any individual to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, no one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him or compels him. So we can't just simply say, oh, I, you know, the, the matter is easy to solve. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Oh, I know that I have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I can't believe in him in that way. I believe the facts, but I just can't trust in him. So then what do we tell them? Well, that's where um, Gerstner's book, Steps to Salvation, can come in handy. And he would say that today this is almost unheard of because people are given the assurance that they belong to Christ whenever they go forward at an altar call and they pray the prayer and they say they believe the facts, they're given assurance they belong to him. But they shouldn't have that assurance until they see Christ being formed in them. So if the marks of grace were also conveyed along with the gospel, perhaps we'd have more people in this category. But what, what do we do? What do we tell them? Well, we tell them that it's not in their hands, it's in God's hands. And so you need to seek the Lord for his mercy. How do you do that? Well, you tell them that they need to use the means of grace, use the means by which God saves, attend church, not because they want to necessarily, because they need to, put themselves under the preaching of the gospel. They need to read the word of God. They need to pray and ask for God's mercy. Now, this doesn't guarantee that they're going to find the Lord or that God's going to have mercy on them. They may very well find him. Many who sought the Lord in, in the days of the Puritans who told them they needed to do this actually did find. And what Edwards would say is, I can't guarantee you you'll find, but I'll tell you this, if you don't seek the Lord, you will certainly perish. So there is hope if you seek him. He is merciful. So may the Lord grant to us, as, as he did you know, to his disciples, as he called them, may he grant to us also that we may be fishers of men, even as they are, and know how to go about this fishing. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord um, to help us to, um, to appropriate at least some of the things that we've heard this evening uh, from, again, the example of our Lord, who was predestinarian, who was believed in election, but he preached to everyone. And he did with confidence. Let's, let's um, spend a few moments in prayer.